Once again, welcome to day two, redefining bio-representation in the digital age, AI-dentity. We're gonna include some AI, of course, in here. Uh, is there anybody in the waiting room? No, waiting room door is open. It's open, so you can come in freely. Uh, usually, after I find Andy waiting there early, Andy is always early for everything all the time. I don't know if you all know this, but this is a great characteristic to have in life. Always, I'm sure she does it in person too. Uh, I, I always feel like there's no reason to be late for a Zoom call. I mean, <laughs> there's no traffic to get here. You just open your phone or your computer or whatever else. Uh, so let's recap. What did you remember from last session or what did you have questions about? And maybe you talked to a buyer since then. Uh, anything, anything or any wins that you want to talk about? Who wants to go first? And I'll move my spotlight. Anyone? Okay, does everybody still have access to all of the scripts that we posted last session, or do you want me to post that again? I feel like Lori's Good about morning, to Jay. Hey, Lori, how are you? Can you hear me? I'm well, thank you. I'm driving. Yeah. So I just pulled over um, because I couldn't see part one, so I wanted to ask you, we were just talking about scripts that you had shared. Can you... Send me um, in an email, whatever I did miss. Is that possible? Uh, I could reply to an email that you send me. <laughs> that would be the best way. Uh, okay. Send it to jman at okay. jmanseminars.com because that'll come through quicker. It takes me a little longer to check my element email. Okay. But I'll send that, but I'm also, I'll put it in the chat right now too, but I know you're on your phone. So let me just. Yeah. I didn't want to miss it, but I'm going to be driving, so I might be going in and out a little bit just to let you know. So thank you, and I look okay. forward to watching you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me go in the chat here, and then I'm going to go here to start out again is the script, scripts that I have. And the goal in this is, like, this was everything that I could think of. I think there's 60 plus things on there, you know, and, and it's less a script and more of like, if they say this, what should I say? If they say this, what should I say? What if they say this? What should I say? What if they ask me this? What should I say? Because I feel like that's where the anxiety and the, you know, the lack of confidence might come from when you get a question from a potential buyer or in your head, you're thinking, what if they ask this? Uh, that creates anxiety. Anxiety usually comes from fear of something that might happen. And I think if you're prepared for it and you've been given all, all the things that I'm giving you, you have all the tools. So you don't have to have the anxiety or at least lessen uh, the anxiety. So there's that. And then I'm gonna post the second thing in here. It is the exclusive buyer's agent expert GPT. Again, if you upgrade to the GPT plus, you'll have access to this. I make zero dollars off of this. This is just uh, something to help you once again. Okay. No other questions? Monica, I really like that blazer jacket. It's nice color. Yeah, Monica, I'm talking Sorry, to you. Sorry, sir. I was driving as well. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you. I have a couple of, I'm waiting for like a warmer weather because a little tough in Florida, but uh, apparently in a couple of weeks we should be good to go. Uh Okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it. And nobody from Florida should ever say they're waiting for warmer weather because I'm in the Northeast. We're really what? waiting for warmer 50. weather. <laughs> for yeah, us, it, 50 is like for you, like 30. Yeah, I, I understand. I went running yesterday and it was 40 degrees and I almost thought about wearing shorts. I almost thought about oh. wearing shorts. I was like, damn, it's 40. This is so nice. Yeah. All right, so who, this is where we're gonna start off since nobody's talking. Wanna go to the slide. I know we left off, you know, we had talked about presenting offers. We had talked about escalation clauses. We, we had finished off on the exclusive right to represent. We reviewed that a little bit, uh, but one of the activities that I wanted to have you all do today is almost like a case study. I'm gonna give you a property and then I'm gonna give you some comps, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the market. And then I'm gonna break you up into groups, and together, you're gonna to write the best damn offer you can to get accepted. 
okay? Uh, I think that'll be fun because you're all competitive and you want your offers to win. And I think nobody ever really talks about offers or terms of conditions as much in a group setting. You may talk to your manager every once in a while, but it's one of the things that you can learn uh, that will truly have the biggest impact on your business. If you're a, a newer agent or just don't work with buyers often, I think it's important that you talk to listing agents in your office. Listing agents know more about buyer's agents than anybody else because they're dealing with multiple buyer's agents on any transaction, right? For me, every time I have 15, you know, we don't get as many, let's say, more recently, my last three uh, listings in the last month have had three to four offers, right? But last year could have been 15, 16, 20. 2021 was bananas uh, or 2022 as well. And so that's when you really know, I can look at all these offers and say, okay, out of 20 offers, 10 of them were cash. Okay, out of the 10 that were cash, none of them had an inspection, right? Uh, the other five of the, of the 10 had conventional financing with 20% down. Then the other five had, you know, FHA or something like that. And so when you really start to study that and or look at the comps when they close, you're going to realize that the price that things sell for directly corresponds to what they're listed for. And you have to know both. You can't just know what it's sold for, right? If I know that in my market, it's selling for 20% over asking, I can't just look at the comps. I have to look at what it was listed for and how much over did it go and why is there, is there a reason for that? And then be able to explain that to my client. So who wants to share with me, how would they educate their client on the market? Like, you know, I want to write an offer and I go to you and I say, what should I offer? How do you explain to them what the market is doing? Anyone? I'm going to ask Anne Marie Ferrara. How would you ex uh, explain that to your to your buyer? A uh, seller's market, and there's not as many buyers, right? And not as many selling right now, so there's more buyers, so it's very competitive. So therefore, we have to be as close to ask as possible in order to get the property or there might even be over ask because if there's way too many people bidding on a property because it's a very competitive market because the neighborhood is better or the house is more updated we may have to go over ask and that's just the way it is right now due to the fact that there's not a lot of inventory okay over ask what does that mean how much over do you think i should go that's going on here in long island i'll tell you right now people are going over ask 35,000 40,000 um it's unfortunate, but because there's no inventory. Um, so it just depends on the house and the situation. You have to feel it out based on how many people are going to the house. You can get a feel, you know, and sometimes the other agent will work with you and say, hey, I already have over ask or I already have that. You know, they're not, not going to tell you the number, but they tell you, look, I'm already over ask by 10,000. I'm already over asked by this much. So if you want to come in, you got to go over that number. They don't tell you the number, but they give you an idea. Yeah. So I like that. Thank you. I just got a house. I had a had buyers that I, uh, yeah. How much? What was, uh, I had 40, I had 35 over ask 35,000 over ask. And so, but tell me that like, I had what to get, was the we got price? the accepted offer. What was the list price on the property though? 949. It was 949. It was updated house in Glen Cove two family. Uh, good. You can get good rental over there and the taxes were low under 15, which is very good for that area. And, um, you know, it was a dog fight basically, cause it's good condition brand, you know, when you, when you can find a two family house that's renovated like that and you can get 4,000 a month rent in each apartment, uh, you know what? And the taxes are l less than 15. So I think he underpriced it to be, to be honest with you to begin with. And then we yeah. first came in at nine forty five. And then he's like, no, we're going to call all offers. And then they had so many offers that we went to 985 and we got it. And he's, he actually had another offer just below us, like 980. So we, we got it for 985. Nice. So um, thanks for sharing. But I, I want to share kind of 
something similar to what you're saying. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about multiple offers and what you're in Nassau or Suffolk, honey, where are you now? I'm in Nassau. 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 Okay, perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you're talking about multiple offers, like the conversation to use Anne Marie's example, I wanted to get a real life example from one of you and thank you for sharing. It's if it's 985, let's just call it a million, right? Close enough. A million dollar property. She's going 4% over ask, which isn't a lot. 4% over ask is not a lot. When, when you say it as a percentage, when you say 35 or 40,000, that seems like, damn, that's 35, 40,000. That's more than I used to make in a year way back when I was a kid, you know? And if you say it like that, where I, that's where if you know your statistics, know it specifically, not just, you can't say county statistics. Uh, I would go directly that direct town, village, whatever it is. You know, your MLS should have some kind of analytics. Um, I know many of them, mine has, it's called Domus Analytics. It says market stats. You can click on that and holy cow. Uh, and, and I just put this in the, in the chat. If you're coming late, I'll put it back in the chat again, where I'm showing you a case study, which is gonna be a subject property that's been on the market for one day. Okay, then I think there's a pending and then there's a couple of solds there. But then I'm also sharing with you the, the market, what the market is doing. Now, I know on average, my entire county is 118.9% list price to sale price ratio, which means on average, they're going 20%. I'm going, you know, so if a buyer comes to me using that data to educate them and go, look, here's what the market's doing. Here's what the average is. You want this property. You said, Jay, do whatever it takes. And there's nothing more stressful when a buyer comes to you and says, I don't care what you have to do. Do whatever it takes. I want that property. And it's like, okay, well, we have to go at least 20% over. But again, to Anne Marie's point, exactly how she said it, you make a call to the listing agent, right? And you say, hey, I plan on writing on that, on that property. Susie and I had this conversation in, in the last uh, session. You know, I, I plan on writing on that property. What matters to the seller most? Good, good seller's agents would say, well, you know, uh, price is important, of course, but they're building a house and maybe they want flexible, a flexible closing date. I, I won three last year because of that. Just asking that question and having buyers that were on a month to month or flexible, uh, they didn't have to sell their house. They could wait to sell it. That alone, I, like I beat out other offers with less money because I could give the flexible terms, right? Asking that question. But then you will get agents who will just spill the beans. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, what is it gonna take? Andy, come on, tell me, what I gotta write? What is the price? I'm giving you a blank check. What's the price on this property? That I, and she's not gonna tell me. She wouldn't, because she's a good agent. Um, you know, But some will. They'll go, you know what, Jay, I, I got three offers. The top is this. Okay, anything else? So I gotta have a quick closing, but tell me. Big earnest money, is that, will that do it? Yeah, okay ask it doesn't hurt to ask you know don't ask in a way like you see how it's the tone in which i'm asking where we're friends and we're trying to work together i'm trying to bring you the best offer possible uh so you tell me i'm not coming in like yo what do i gotta do i got cash money tell me the offer right now and it's like you come at me like that <laughs> you're going to the bottom of the pile if i have multiple and and, and you know there can be multiple offers with escalation clauses so then it's it's really just where does it end, you know? Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We have 20 lovely future buyer agents extraordinaires, or- Damien. Agents ever, yes. Damien, sorry, can I, can I add one more thing to what you said? Oh, yeah, also, go ahead. I always, I always ask if they're okay with an escalation clause because oh, yeah. I've, had, I've had people mm -hmm be like no like once they see the escalation clause like it pisses them off i sold my last property to someone with an escalation clause i personally like them i chose that buyer because i liked it but i have had sellers who are not <laughs> i've had sellers who are not down so ask that question always ask if they're okay, okay with an escalation clause let's let's do this because we're going to break uh into groups and you're all going to write offers as a group on on a, a property and and so Susie, you're gonna be my buyer's agent. I'm gonna be the buyer. Everybody's gonna take notes on what I say because this is gonna help you to structure your offer, okay? I'm ready, Susie. Susie, I really love this house. Hold on, I'm trying to, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. 
Okay, ready. Um, that's awesome. What do you love about it? I mean, everything. It has the kitchen. It has the backyard. It has the pool. It has the finished basement. We don't have to do anything. I just have to turn the key. This is this is what I'm about. I I, I have to have this. Okay. Well, I totally get that. Um, so what do you feel comfortable writing with your offer? Whatever it takes. Well, the house is listed at 1.5. How do you feel about that price? Seems like a suggestion to me in this market, right? I mean, I see list prices and I see what they actually sell for. I feel like list price is just a starting point. That's an interesting thought. Okay. Well, based on the last two homes that have sold down the street, there's one that sold for a million four fifty and another one that sold at one point six. So if you were to ask me, I'd say one point five is right in line with the comparable sales. What do you feel comfortable offering? I trust you. So you know that I have conventional financing, I have enough to put down. Uh I'd like to do, you know, if it helps, like a large down payment, earnest money. I don't know how, how y'all do it where you're from, but in New York, we call it earnest money deposit. Um, I've flipped properties when I was younger. I don't, I already walked through the property. I don't think I need an inspection. So I'd probably waive that. And then like, we don't have to sell our house where we live. So I'm really flexible with the closing date. Okay. Um, okay, that makes sense. So in regards to this particular property, I found out that the owners are actually moving out of state. Um, they have already found their next property. So that's good. And it sounds like they do want a standard 30 day escrow. Are you okay with that? 30 days? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. 30 day escrow. Now, given that the amount of people were at the last open house, I really would encourage you to make an off a strong offer just to start. I probably wouldn't come in under asking, but again, if you feel that's a suggestion and you don't feel comfortable doing that, I'm, I'm fine with doing what you feel is best. Susie, I trust you. You said there's comps for less. Can I get it for less? Do you think I could get it for? The only one that's less is about 50,000 less. And that was six months ago when the market was a little slower. All right. What's the number? I would come in at ask or slightly above ask if you really want to be strong. I mean, I always like to tell people this, you know, if you find out that someone else were to purchase the home for a million five or a million five fifty, would that upset you? Yeah, I would burn the house okay. down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Okay. Well, considering that I was told by the agent they are going to counter everybody that comes in, and I do believe this house is going to get multiple offers, I wouldn't come in anything less than asking. I really think we should start off on a strong foot and let them know that we mean business. I want to do an escalation clause. A friend of mine saw it on TV and heard it was good. Okay. And escalation clause isn't bad. I wouldn't recommend starting out the offer that way. I would recommend that we go about that route after we receive a counter. I was told by the seller's agent that they do plan on countering everybody. I did also ask if they plan to counter everybody or just the top few. The agent says that they always encourage their sellers to counter everybody, but in the event that they do decide to only counter the top few, I really want you to be in the running for that so that we can come ring, in ring, on that second ring, go ring. around. Ring, ring, Susie. This is the listing agent. Ring, ring. Hi, how are you? Susie, you're not going to get a second bite at this apple. Come in with your highest and best. Okay, got it. Who was that, Susie? That was a listing agent. They actually said that they are only going to take the highest and best offer. They're not going to do a second round of counters. So knowing that information now, I think we should come in as strong as possible. Okay. All right, let's do this. Okay, now everybody take everything you heard in that conversation. I'm going to break you up into groups. Make sure in the chat, I have posted one that says case study and one that says the market, okay? Uh, but just so you understand, I'm gonna sh I'll share a couple things with you before we break. I'm gonna go over here to my shared screen, yes. And then I'm gonna come over here to Dumbass Analytics Market Review. Do -do -do -do. Give me a second. I gotta fix a couple things, but while I'm doing this, uh, make sure to do it and pull out what you have in the chat because I got to reselect the right county. One second, Monmouth, and then Pittsburgh. So many of you have access to these statistics. If not, you definitely have access to RPR if you're in a realtor market. Both can provide the statistics that I'm showing you here as far as list price to sale price ratio. Um, here you go. 
So you'll see that the median sales price is 505, closed sales, the list price, um, list price to sale price ratio, see that there? Let me just move myself over just a little bit, is 106.6%. Okay, that means on average, the property sell for 6.6% over asking. I'm not going to do the math for you, but you see what uh, the average is, et cetera. Average days on market is 10. The listing that we're writing on has been on the market for one day. Okay, everybody have all those stats okay? Yes? If you're on camera, go like this. If you're off camera, I'm imagining you. Um, okay. Let's see. I'll go like this. This makes it more fun. I'm going to go breakout rooms, and then I'm going to do one, two, three, four. Yeah, we're going to do four groups of five. And in your group, you're going to talk about what's the best damn offer you can write because there will be no counters. There will be no callbacks, okay? There will be three people that are crying tears in a bucket that they didn't win, and they may say it's your fault. Okay, assign automatically. Here we go. Create and open all rooms. Anne Marie, are you here still? And Marie, can you hear me?
Hello, ladies. Sorry to leave you here all alone. Trina, can you hear me? Uh, okay. I'm going to chat the breakout rooms. Does somebody have a question? One minute, one minute remaining. Finish up your offers. Finish up your offers. Sharpen your pencils. Know what you're going to say and elect a spokesperson. Vincent, welcome, sir. We're just in a breakout room right now. They're writing offers. We're going to come back in a group here, uh, writing for 10 offers on a property. And then we're going to debrief. Each of the groups is going to present their offer. And I'm going to decide as the listing agent which one I'm taking. And which I'm going to be not. the fly on the wall. I've been anticipating yeah. this and it, it somehow <laughs> slipped through the cracks. But thank you for letting me join late. I appreciate sure. it. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. So, Tiffany, did you duly elect a spokesperson in your group? We did. Who is it? It's Lori. Lori! There's a place where I live here called Lori's Natural Food. So, every time I hear your name, I hear their jingle. You can and, get uh, your food And Anne Marie, I'm, uh, I'm on the South Shore. Oh, okay. Gotcha. A Anne Marie, are you in here twice? Do you have like a second device? Wait, what? I'm sorry. You're in here twice. Like you're in here, but then you're also in I here am? with the second screen. Yeah, if you look at all the all the gallery. It's okay. No worries. Oh. It's better to be here. It's better to be here twice than not at all. Oh. Don't worry about it. You're good. Okay, sorry about that. All right. So Lori is representing uh we're gonna call it group Long Island because I think they had three out of <laughs> three out of five was Long Islanders. Uh Lori's gonna represent <laughs> group one. Uh, group two, who's your spokesperson? If you're in group two or don't know. We, okay. Wait, how, how do you know what group you're in? in? Yeah, yeah which group? group you're in? Okay, Susie, you're the spokesperson for your group. Okay. Andy, you're the spokesperson for your group. And then there's one more group. We'll figure that out after the first three uh, speak. Who wants to go first in the presentation of their offer? That's Lori does. Dangerous. That's it's okay. okay. Lori. Yeah. Okay, I'm Jay ready. Man. So you're the listing agent. So That's correct. Jay, I have a, a great offer for you. Our buyer is very well qualified. Um, they've been vetted. We know that you um, have the home listed at 505. Um, I understand that the sellers are moving out of state. So we are happy to help them um, with the house as well, with all those items that they still have in the house, if that would be helpful to them to empty those items. We're coming uh -huh. in high and we're coming in high and strong at 565. Our buyers putting down 30%. They are going to waive their inspection and we would like to have we do have an escalation clause that we will beat your highest and best offer by five thousand um, dollars you can see that we have the pre-approval and the proof of funds to match that 30 percent and i just reached out to the mortgage broker i'm sorry i don't have it right at this moment but we are looking to get a pre-commitment letter also to show that we are able to move quicker as your sellers are anxious to get going and they're ready to move forward um, my buyer loves the, this property and they're very anxious to move forward. Okay. And we Any have an honor, Go honor ahead. about date within the 60 days. Okay. Any cap on that escalation clause? No. No cap. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, Lori. I have a couple more agents that are presenting their offers. I'll, I'll call you back. Uh, as soon as I hear something, I won't wait till the Thank deadline. Thank you. You're welcome.
Okay, Susie on line two. Hi, Jamin. How are you today? I'm doing great, Susie. Give me the good news. Okay, so we've got an offer here for you at 585 with an escalation clause of 5,000 up to 600K as a cap. My client's gonna waive inspections. They're fully underwritten approved, so we don't need a loan contingency. All we need is that appraisal. And they're willing to cover an appraisal gap of up to $20,000 if needed. And we can also shorten our escrow to 15 days instead of 30. Hold on, you must be from New York. You're a fast talker. Uh, appraisal gap coverage fully? You the, said... they'll, they'll cover a gap of 20,000. 20,000, okay. And how much down were they going to? Uh, they are putting, where's my, they're putting 50% down. 50% down. Okay. They actually may not even need the appraisal because they have such a down, a high down payment and they're fully underwritten approved. So I just have to check with the lender back on that. But um, I've also got the lender's information that I'll CC you on so that we can all be in communication. I'm super easy to work with. I'm straightforward. I like to get the job done. And considering they're going to waive inspection, this should be a straightforward deal. All right, Susie. I like you already. I'll call you back soon. Thanks. Bye. We got Andy on line three. Andy on line three. Hi, Damon. How are you today? Good. Great, actually. So I have I an offer for you. So. Yeah. You got a couple offers in? That's great. I know they can't be ours. Uh, we okay. are an all cash offer. We will do a seven day close, no contingency, no inspections, 10% down. We do have an escalation oh. cost of 10,000 up to 650,000 for the house. If you tell us yes, we'll go ahead and help your seller um, with closing costs if needed. Where did the buyer get cash from? Because last I checked there, they only had enough for conventional financing. No, did no, no. Call somebody? We, have, we have proof of funds. So we'll go ahead and give you that if you need it. Trust okay, me, this happened in Florida K. all the time. <laughs> Waived inspection. What else? How much? So down? it would be all cash, seven day close, no contingency, no inspections, 10% down, escalation clause of um, up to 650,000, 10,000 per escalation. Okay. Now, Do they, do they have to close quickly? Because my people are moving out of Not state really. and a quick close might be, okay. It would be great if we can close quickly, but they're a little flexible. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. thank you very much. That's no a pretty problem. good offer. Thank you. You're welcome. There's one more group that I didn't hear from. If it, this was your group, speak up now. Do, 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 do. We oh, need that song. Na, 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 da, da, I know I have the Jeopardy sound so, in, in my thing, but I want to get it right now. Okay, so we'll just review these three because it's good enough for us to learn from, right? Now, uh, Lori's offer was five sixty five, and with a five thousand over the highest, no cap. Now, Andy's offer is a cap of six fifty, right? So that means Lori's offer is six fifty. Five, right? Let me just, I'm going to write this uh, so you can see this visually. I'm going to share my other screen here like this. Okay. So we have 565, right? 565,000, but that's, oh, I got a percentage there. 565,000, that's escalated because you said 5,000 over the highest. So 565,000 escalated to 655, but conventional financing 30% down. Okay. Now we have Susie's. That goes up to 600K. Susie's out of the mix. It was 585. Escalated to 600. To be fair, yes. J-Man, there's other things that I would have like done in there that, that I would have laid out, but. Susie, that, it's okay. yeah, it's okay. See, this is 
the competitive to... spirit, the competitive spirit in agents like, no, 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 you don't know. I would have sharpened my pencil a little bit more. I would have got this deal. Andy came in. Eric, do you I don't have a like question? to lose, but Andy's deal was pretty. That's that's hard to beat. Yeah, no, I just wanted to ask. We used six and a half is what you said the average was in terms of what houses are selling above list. Is that was that correct? Because they seem to be coming in higher than <laughs> is was that the number? Whatever I gave you on the market statistics. I don't remember. Anyone... Was it six point six? Yeah, six it was like five. six point it was like six point okay, five. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. So I mean if you think that but that's just an average. Yeah, that's just an average. That's thirty grand on a five hundred thousand dollar listing. Uh but it's an average. So when, if your client goes to you like, what can we do to make sure that we get this? This is where it, it does get a little bit bananas. Now, 650K, 10,000 over up to 650K. Actually, I'm wrong. I'm, I apologize. 610K is actually what your offer is going to be, which makes this 615. So that makes sense. You said 10,000 over the highest. So we escalated Susie's to 600, 10K over that is 610, and then 5,000 over that, no cap is 615. Everybody with that? Yeah. Jose, question? The ones with the, they didn't have a cap? The first one did not have a cap. Okay. So but 5,000, the best offer. 5,000 over no cap, but here's where, where I, I want to, cause I love doing this because now we can break these down and, and, and unpack them. If you will, 5,000 over, if you're a seller, for those of you who have dealt with sellers, if you, would your seller take an offer that's 5,000 more with financing over something else that's cash? Never cash is king. Yeah. Well, cash is king unless there is a number. There is an amount, okay, because I have won over cash with financing, but you have to decide for yourself, and that's dependent on the price range. 500, that might be, shoot, 20 grand, 20 grand over highest offer, highest bona fide offer, because then it's like, okay, if I'm comparing, if I'm comparing uh, financing to cash and it's 20,000, I'll wait a month to see if the, the financing works out. And I, and I really loved, if you didn't catch, Lori said pre-committed, which means it's already been submitted and went through to underwriters. Like that's the best form of financing. And so that's a conversation for the listing agent to have, uh, depending. Now, if it's a million dollar property, that might be a, 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 might have to be a hundred thousand dollar difference, fifty thousand. Like it's it's up to you and your knowledge and expertise and asking listing agents, like, hey, if you were a listing agent, what would you take with financing over cash? Some listing agents might say nothing. But the, I don't think that's an accurate answer. If it's half a mil, they wouldn't say that, right? It just, it, it all depends. It all depends. Breaking it down on, on what matters to the, to the seller most um, in the escalation clause and the inspection and stuff like that. Now, this goes without saying, but depending on what state you're in, every state has some kind of uh, waiving of the inspection liability form right? That the buyer signs, like I, I understand that I was, I was able to do an inspection, but I didn't uh, just to defer some of that liability that can happen tomorrow after they close when the water heater breaks and you, you, they'll say that you told them not to have an inspection and they sue everybody. Okay. Was that helpful? Yeah. Just to kind of do some, some hands-on type stuff. Now I was sharing with you, there's a couple different ways for you to help clients understand market realities, right? The first, uh, any kind of statistics you might have that you could get from your real estate board, and let me just spotlight this real quick. Any kind of statistics that you can get from your real estate board uh, is is helpful. You want to have that with you all the time. But uh, if you're in a realtor market, which is outside of New York City for the most part, if you're in a realtor market, then uh, RPR, your realtor property resource, uh, is a great way, right? If you're working with sellers, you can create it a really robust seller's report. But in this uh, scenario, in working with buyers, you can create a property report that's 60 to 80 pages that has, man, your high Cs, your your engineers and analytical types are going to be like, oh my gosh, I love this so much because it has all these charts and graphs and just statistics. And really that helps you if you're a newer agent 
or you're unfamiliar with the market, or they want to, they want a hard, fast answer from you. You have to take a position, right? You're the expert. Like you heard me say, Susie, what's the number? Oh, well, I think she, she was confident, right? You don't want to go, Oh, you know, I'm pretty sure we could try it at, I don't want to try nothing. I want to win. Okay. What's the number? And you gotta, you gotta be like, this is what I think the number is. Wow. That's high. Yeah, it is high, but you want to win. That's, that's the number. If you want to take a risk and maybe get, you know, uh, and I love the question that Susie asked me, would you be okay if we lost this for a few thousand dollars? And I'm like, no, I'll burn the house down. I love it that much. I don't want anybody else to have it. Right. And, and that's where the first group that had that no cap, depending on where you are, uh, you know, if attorneys do your contracts or not, where I'm at, we have all, all contracts are contingent on attorney approval, but in a no cap situation, you get a phone call from the agent and says, here's the number. Are you okay with that? At least you get the call. If it's a few thousand over what your cap would have been, man, how awful would that be, right? Your client finds out 60 days later, they look at, everybody will go back and look at the one that, you know, it's like, I wonder what my high school sweetheart's doing now. Same thing. <laughs> you know, you look at the, the one that you lost and see what it sold for. So NAR, RPR is the site, right? How's the market? It's our, our favorite question we get again and again and again. He lost me. That's right, Andy. He did. Okay. Uh, but realtor property resource is, is your biggest tool. I use this not just with buyers, but you can use it at open houses to attract buyers. Uh, you have in their neighborhood reports, uh, you have market activity reports and you have school reports. And, uh, I'll take a little post-it note and I'll put, you know, do not take, and I'll put that on the table and it, it makes people want it more. Okay. I promise you they're going to be like, can I have this? No, no, you can't. That's our only copy. However, I'd be happy to send you a personalized one, right? Real estate's hyper-local. You have to understand, uh, you know, what zip code, what neighborhood, you know, do you want more information on? And I'll get that to you by the end of day. Now, then you have a, a reason. Excuse me, Jamie? Yeah. I dropped out and I lost, I was out for a minute. Can you just tell me what this is? When are you utilizing the real property, this report? That you're not uh, realtor property about. resource. So I'm using this to help educate the clients on the market realities, right? When they come to us and I'll, I, I do it multiple times in the initial meeting, when I'm doing my buyer presentation, they ask me how the market is. I'm educating them. I, I might go page by page, depending on, on what area they're interested in. Oh, you're interested in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is the hottest town within our County. Their list price to sale price to ratio is this, their average sale price is this. And actually, um, Realtor.com listed it as one of the top 10 hottest neighborhoods in all the land. That's a true story in all of, in all of the United States. So then I'm educating them on that. And then again, when we're going to write offers, not only do I look at the comps, the comparables in the area, I look at the actives because that's what, what else somebody could buy. I look at the pendings because that's what just sold. And if I know those agents, I might call them too and say, Hey, I saw you, you just went pending. Could you share with me kind of the range? How much over did you, right. did you get? Or, you know, and this is where like you, if you have a good working relationship, I call agents and I get that info and they, they call me and get the info too, right? That's collaboration at its, at its, at its greatest. Does that, that help, Lori? I'm aware of the seller's, uh, yeah, I'm aware of the seller's report, but I haven't used anything else. So that's why I was Okay. Asking. So you, you have seller's report, property report, you have a mini po property report, and you have a neighborhood report and a school report and a market activity report. Those are all, all of them. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. So we don't have a lot of time to go over. I mean, I could do 90 minutes just on RPR, but if you go to NARRPR.com, you need your nerds number. I, they changed what that's called now, but I'm forever going to call it a nerds number. It's right on, on the label of your realtor magazine. You can log in there and they have a ton of pre-recorded webinars that you can learn from. Okay. So that's, here's all your reports, seller, property, market activity, neighborhood report, and school report. Again, somebody asked me just, just yesterday, wow, why is, why are the houses so cheap? Is it because it's a bad neighborhood? Like in this one area, they were looking for investment properties. I'm like, well, I can't really comment on the neighborhood, uh, but here's some statistics that you could use to clarify and distinguish what neighborhoods you'd like to search in. So I'm not steering. I'm not saying anything about neighborhoods, always being uh, the source of of the source strategy. So we just did the strategy. We talked a little bit about it terms, right? What are the three things when people consider 
in writing an offer, terms, price, conditions, price, terms, conditions, PTC, what's, what's missing from that? There's one thing that's more important than all the rest. It's about relationships. See my nice little AI? Isn't that nice? You got a warm heart there. It's about relationships and treating agents the right way. That's going to help you get your offers accepted more than price terms, conditions, any day of the week. Sometimes does it come down to price? If it's, <laughs> Yeah, but if it's very close, which when you have multiple offers, there's only so many variations of, of an offer people can write. And, and then it comes down to like, oh, I, I know Anne-Marie. I did a deal with her before. She was great to work with. I know I went through to closing, you know, or... I, I knew this this guy. <laughs> this guy yelled at me when he showed the property, yelled at me after the property, yelled at me that he was going to, you know, um, send me an offer the whole time. And and, and he, I know that's exactly what I put in, angry agent yelling at his phone in front of a luxury home. That was my prompt that I used there. Um, but we all know these people in our market. They exist, right? But it's not going to be you. Okay, we, we talked about this in the first session. If you weren't here, we talked about like the relationship starts from when you first, if you still call to schedule showings in your market uh, or if you're using showing time, it's like I'm really friendly when I'm showing it. And when I get there, uh, if anything's wrong with the house, I'll call and tell them about it. And when I'm leaving, uh, you know, I'll let them know if there's interest because some of you think that we have to call you if there's multiple offers and that's not the case. It may be customary in your market to get a phone call but if you don't tell the agent, hey, you know, Gabriel, I, I really like this house. Uh, if anything comes in, could you please let me know? Because you do not have to be, it's, there's no law that says uh, I, I have to tell you. It's customary, but I can tell you there's been times that I've told agents that I had multiple offers on a listing. You know what happened? I went from hero to zero really fast. I had three offers that went to zero offers because all three didn't want to compete. And I didn't tell the seller, and all I said was, oh, it's great. We've got multiple offers. We tell everybody we're going to jack the price up. And I was brand new. I didn't know at the time. So I'm sharing that negative experience with you all so you can realize, you know, that it's not always uh, going to work out the way you think. Yeah, so that's why I did. Here's a nice one. Or would you rather be the Mary Poppins of real estate? All right, a spoonful of sugar makes all offers go down. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody saw that. Mary Poppins part two yet, but it's not that bad. Okay, I'm with myself over there. Yeah, so it all starts, and, and this is where for those of you that do volunteer uh, to be on committees and part of the boards and Women's Council of Realtors and Young Professionals Network, uh, all those things where people go, why do you do that? It's a thanks, thankless task. No, it's not, because usually the people that volunteer for those things are the ones that are doing business because they see the value, and that's where the relationships uh, develop. All right, let's talk a little bit about home inspections. Now, in our scenario, we waived the home inspection. I said that I was a uh, previous home. All right, excuse me. This is all being recorded. It might be posted. Uh, I said that I was a, a flipper in my past life, and I was okay. I looked over the house. Now, I'm always going to recommend that they have an inspection if there's competition. It, it makes it challenging, right? I, I can tell you just yesterday, uh, we accepted an offer that was $20,000 less because it didn't have an inspection. The one that was more had an inspection. It was just worth it. I just said to the seller, I said, wow, what and this property needed some, it wasn't, it wasn't the shiny penny, okay? It, it needed some work. And so to the sellers, he's like, man, I don't know. I know that it needs about 15, 20 with my contractor, but you get the wrong contractor in there. That could be 50, 60, right? And then it, then they're going get to the, get the deal and then try to renegotiate because that's also a strategy. So it's explaining all the possible outcomes to your clients. Um, and then we had somebody else that wanted to offer $50,000 more after we had already accepted an offer. What do you do then? Let's say, depending on your market, um, if you're in New York, you know, New York, Long Island, it went to the attorneys, you're already in contract, you're good. But somebody wants to offer you 50K, 10% over asking. 
What do you do? Anne Marie, shaking your head. Is it a no? Yeah, you can't. Uh, most people. No. No. Okay. No. Anybody else think otherwise? They're in, in contracts. Yeah, you're in contract. I agree. Lori, what do you say? I wasn't yeah. quite hearing. I couldn't ha hear Anne Marie, but um, I I have always been told that I have to present all offers at any time. Huh. So even yeah. if it's under contract, you still have to go as much as that sucks <laughs> to your yeah. seller and, and present it. Yes. Uh, Tiffany, or something you want to add to that too? Yeah. I mean, I have a buyer recently who she lost out on a property and then it went into contract and then she decided she was like, I want to up my offer. And we submitted an offer to a property that's already under contract. So, yeah. you know, if that deal does fall apart, hopefully they come around back to us. And... Absolutely. But yeah. So I've had, I've had offers on properties that I have under contract and I still present them. You have to. Uh, to Lori's point, yep. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah. Thank you, Lori. Uh, all offers have to be presented all the way, <clears throat> all the way until closing. Yeah. Okay. I I, I know a transaction. Uh, in Queens, when they went one hundred fifty thousand over asking, seller was like, "I'm an honorable person, but it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars." And so, they waited until the mortgage, right? You have a mortgage contingency in contracts. And it was a day late. It killed it. They took the other offer for 150K more. But somebody could breach the contract. For 150K, you could hire an attorney and still have money left over a lot. So the, the point is, like if your buyer says, we need to you know, resubmit an offer, I'm salty because I didn't get my, my offer, which will happen. I knew I should have listened to you. I knew I should have went a little bit more. Uh, you still have to present it. You call the agent and say, hey, I'm, I'm sending an offer. Please present it even if it's contingent on non-performance of the first offer. Okay, whatever, what, and, and that's a backup offer in that situation. At least they know that you're doing everything that you can to get them the house, right? Because one of our fiduciary duties is to obey, right? Which is do what they say. Okay, so with home inspections, boop, buyer beware, we understand that, but there's a, a number of things that we wanna cover here. Number one, make sure that there's a waiver of liability of some sort that's being signed. Uh, the other thing that, that was becoming quite common when the market was super hot, 21, 22, uh, was a mini inspection when you show the home. So if Andy's a listing agent, I'd say, Andy, you know, uh, we're going to do a mini inspection that does not, we're not going to, we're going to be there for the same 30 minute showing. We're just bringing the home inspector with us. He's not taking any photos or anything. It's just a walk and talk. He doesn't even do a formal report. It's actually half the price. Uh, of a home inspection. At least they have a second set of eyes, somebody who has some authority and some expertise. Okay, so if you work with home inspectors, this is just another great way to say, I'm doing everything I can to protect you. I don't think you could put a, an inspection contingency in here, but let's walk through. It's much better than dad, granddad, Uncle Frank, or whoever else that's that's kicking the tire, kicking the furnace, really, right? Come, oh, this furnace is so old, it's gotta be replaced. And he doesn't know Jack about anything, and he's you know gonna blow it up. Uh, number three here, do an inspection, but not a contingency. That will work in some markets, uh, depending, meaning we're going to do an inspection, but it's not a contingency in the contract. Uh, I've done that many times. Do an inspection, but have a price limit on repairs. Like we're going to do an inspection, uh, but we're going to limit any credit that we may ask to $5,000. So that earlier example that I gave you, where we were looking at like 15, 20,000, they said, you know, we're going to cap it at five. We think there isn't going to be any issues, but we'll cap it at five. We see that the roof is bad. We see this, we see that, you know, and, and it's educating your client as well that we're looking for latent defects, things that you can't see with the naked eye as you walk around the house. Like you shouldn't bring up that it needed a new roof or that the exterior needed painting if that's something that you could see when you walked around the house, All right, That's not the point of a home inspection. Uh, and depending on where you are in the country, there's different laws in regards to mold, right? In New York, is it all of New York? I think it's the same for Long Island, right? If there is a darkening of the wood or, or mildew looking like so, it can't be called mold by the home inspector, it has to be separately evaluated by a mold remediation company, and then it has to be taken care of by a separate company. 
So it's tested by one company and then um, remediated by another company because there was a conflict of interest with mold people coming in. They used to say mold is gold. The mold people would come in and go, oh yeah, all this needs to be up. Oh, mm -hmm. And then they write whatever it is and then it had to be done because it was a deal killer and everybody saw a 2020 episode on black mold. Okay, so understand that. Uh, keep a standing appointment with an inspector. If like you have a buyer and it's a first time home buyer and they're like, I don't care, I absolutely must do a home inspection. Okay, then when you present your offer, if you work with a home inspector on a regular basis, they have wiggle room in their schedules, right? And so if I use uh, Marie, Marie Saka, if I use Marie quite often and she calls me, she's like, hey, could you get me in tomorrow at nine o'clock? Yes, I can. So when I present my offer, I say, we're going to do an inspection, but we're going to do it tomorrow morning. I've already called the inspector. We can get it done by 11 o'clock and have it removed by one. Okay, so, so that contingency is either an issue or it's not, but we are offering you more money, you know, or whatever else might be better in your offer. Okay, and then the, the last one, uh, which used to be more common in years past, uh, rarely happens, but I recommend it if I'm a listing agent, you know, did the seller have a pre-listing inspection? Okay, pre-listing inspection. That means before they listed the house, they did an inspection. It's a great way to find out what might be deal killers in the house, and then you take care of it all. And then I share that with the buyer's agent so they're, they're more confident in waiving their inspections, and we're disclosing everything and anything just shows that your property is is better than average, better than the competition that's out there. Question, Lori? You're on mute. I have a question. Yeah. This is Jackie. Um, two things. Um, one is, do you know if the es escalation clause is allowed in New York State? It is. Okay, because we haven't used it much. And then the other thing is, um, with the escalation clause, uh, does the selling agent let's say if i'm a buyer's agent does a selling agent have to disclose the last offer so that we know we're beating the last offer yes uh typically uh almost all of the escalation clauses i've seen they say that some kind of proof of other offer what we usually do it's a redacted first and second page depending you know like where your mortgage and you know your terms and your price are they don't need the whole thing, but they don't need the buyer's name either or anything else like that. So, so just would, like would... a piece of the email where they got the offer is sufficient? Um, yeah, if it's not in writing, if that's if that's how you're receiving it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You know what, though? Thank you for asking that question, Jacqueline, because the other offer... Uh, Andy's that was all cash and it was 650. I forgot to mention this. What I could have done was called Andy and say, Hey, uh, the seller wants to counter your offer for 650. And Andy could say, Well, I just need to see proof of the other offer. We said 10,000 over. So if you have another offer for 640, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I could say, Well, we're not exercising your escalation clause. What we're doing is we're countering your offer for the 650, which you said was the maximum that your buyer was willing to pay. Now, Andy, being a good agent, she has already prepared her buyer for that, that we might get a counter or that 650 might be the offer that is accepted. And then she goes back and says, great news. We got a counter offer for 650. Not like, oh, I'm not going to go back to the buyer and go, oh, man, we got a 650 counter. I don't know. They might be, you know, the win is the house. It's a difference in a multiple offer situation. The win is that you get the house. Lori, do you have another question? Yes. If you could please tell me when we're talking about waiving inspections, does Douglas Elliman have a waiver of some sort for us already that we can use to have the, our buyer sign? That's a good question. I would say talk to your I really manager. I would like maybe... to draw that up to myself. You know. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to draw it up yourself because it's a no. legal document. So I, I would say, <laughs> Tiffany, you're shaking your head. Anne Marie's shaking her head. Does I would check the LIBOR website or check the inst. Do you use Instanet or would you use AuthentiSign? Check in there. There might be forms that are approved for the state that are in there that you may not know about. I would check there, and if not, uh, I'll talk to Jeffrey to see if there is one for. You said my name. You know, oh, it's really here. a good point. It's really Jeff, a good is, point, Zane, that I brought that you brought it up because I've worried about that in the past when because I never question. really suggest that. Escalation. 
escalation clause for the company in in the Long Island region? Um, I do. Well, first of all, you shouldn't be you sh you don't write contracts, so why would you have an escalation clause? No, well, when an we, inspection is waived, we're asking if oh, there the is waiver a of form. Liability. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes. When the inspection is waived. Which I never they recommend, go... but there have been buyers that have chosen that, and I've thought about that afterwards. I, if they ever came back, I would be, you know. Okay, so it what could be a problem. Back up, back up the inspection, waiving of inspection, what are you asking? Yeah, is there a waiver of liability form for waiving of the inspection? I doubt the attorney would have him sign one, so is there something for the agents? What? I'm going to ask again, why are you even involved in that? If a buyer is putting in an offer and they want offer. to waive the inspection, we want to be removed from liability of saying yeah. we suggested that they don't do the inspection. So do we have a waiver removing us from the liability from that situation? No, because the only thing you'd be filling out would be the offer to purchase. Is that correct? The only, what, what, what do you, if I want to make an offer to Long Island, what do you fill out? Well, yeah, offer to purchase. You thought the offer to purchase, correct? Yeah. Okay. Which is a non-binding binder. It means absolutely nothing, zero, nada, zilch, nothing. So I could write in there with my firstborn child and Jeremiah's firstborn child, and it means absolutely nothing. What it means to you is once it goes to contract, that's what it. That's the only thing that means anything. Yeah. By New York, because you have a nine right, but, if they, but if they then get into contract and then they close on the house and then like a you know a month or two later something breaks or whatever, they never did an inspection. Well that you know, so that would be in the contract would be waiving the inspection. Right. But if so they the attorney, if they turn oh, around oh, wait, and wait, say one second, one second. So that's the attorney to advise them. If they're waiving a con if they're waiving a contingency or not, that is not up to you to advise them because that is giving legal advice. Once it gets to contracts, it's the attorney writing in uh, no inspection period, no this or inspection with, you know, a buyer still reserves the right to inspection but does not um, will not ask for repairs. All that type of stuff is for the contract because that's the only thing that means anything in New York is the contract. The binder or offer to purchase means nothing, zero, nada, zilch, nothing. So you wouldn't need something saying, "Oh, I'm not holding, I'm not holding the agent liable for me waiving my inspection," because ultimately the waiver of the inspection has to do with the attorney and the contract and the contingencies that are waived as part of the contract, not as part of the offer. Okay. okay. It's a good idea to put that in the deal sheet. To yeah, the again, but, but again, but again, but the deal sheet means nothing. The offer to purchase means nothing in New York. The only thing that means anything is the contract. That's the only thing that means anything. That's why we have an attorney review period in New York State. So I'll share with everyone what I've done and then Jeff, you can say whether or not this is a good idea because we don't have like an actual form for them to sign or whatever. I will write an email to my client saying, Hey, as we discussed, you have chosen to waive the inspection against my advice. Please confirm. And that's what I do to cover yeah, my ass. I, ne I never want them coming back around to me saying, well, you told me I shouldn't have an inspection. To right. Keep, so to, to keep a paper trail of it, absolutely. Right. I would not necessarily put under against my advice. So I would probably put it, hey, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chosen. Smith, per our, per our conversation, um, you on your own accord have decided to waive the inspection. Because telling a person to get an inspection or not get an inspection could if they wanted to, they could say, well, you're giving legal advice because that's part of the contract and something has to be waived or not. So I would just put it that you on your own accord or you, uh, uh, something along those lines, not that you've advised against it or advised for it. Okay, let's move on. Um, let me oh, shoot. I just did, did something here. 
<laughs> How did I, I hid my self view? Going back to the gallery. Jeffrey, could you spotlight my screen if you can? You are spotlighting. No, I'm not. It's on speaker view. There you go. Spotlighted. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to finish off here with AI tools for hidden inventory. We talked about this in the first session, but, uh, you know, you can be a really great buyer's agent if you can help your buyers find properties to buy. And the big difference is that I'm not trying to get listings. What I'm trying to do is sell the property. Right. If I call a FISBO, it's the I have a buyer script. If I call an expired, it's the same thing. Uh, it's I, I have a buyer script and I don't want to list it. I don't want to list it. I have a buyer. This is what they're looking for. It's a four bedroom, two bath, 2,000 square foot colonial in your area. Uh, if you're ever thinking about making a move, what a great opportunity. You don't have to get it ready. You don't have to show the house. You don't have to do anything. We'll be flexible in our terms and conditions and give you the price that you desire. What do you think your home is worth? Right. And then just have a conversation with them. Uh, so. I'm going to show you a bunch of tools here that can help you distinguish in that neighborhood. We used to door knock an entire area to find the one or two or five people that might be interested uh, in selling. So finding sellers, I'm going to do it a couple different ways. Uh, we have Remind, we have HomeSnap Pro, which I'm going to, I have to take that off the list because that's done. It's purchased by homes.com, which is also uh, CoStars, the parent company, and they're, They've gotten rid of it, depending on what market you're in. You may still have it, but it's going away. Uh, I'll show you a couple things on Realist as well. Revaluate and then Smart Zip. So Remind, here's a quick recording. Make sure I can turn the sound on here. Okay. Today featuring Cell Score, an analytic tool that identifies which off-market residential properties are likely to transact sooner than others. Click on Sell Score on your Discover page and choose from high, medium, or low, and apply to the map, and the properties in that Sell Score area will remain. Note that high denotes a property that is in the top 5% to likely sell within the next six months. Medium the property is in the next 15% of properties that are likely to sell. And low, the property is in the lower 80% of the properties, meaning it is less likely to sell. Okay, so to use this as an example, this is Remind. Many of you have this. If you're in South Florida, it's part of your uh, board provided. I think LIBOR has this as well, right? Long Island Board of Realtors, you have access to Remind, right? Uh, California depending on some of the markets over there. Kat, are you there? Can you hear me? Do you have Remind? R-E-M-I-N-E? R-E-I-M-I-N-E? I think you do. Yes. But I, you do. Okay, perfect. Yes. So you see here, just in, in this example, I could filter by sell score, but I could also, I could say, man, uh, maybe I want to find some rental properties. I could go by absentee landlord, which means the tax record is different than the the, the proper the tax billing address is different than the property address. It's usually an absentee landlord or a rental property. Um, I could filter out flood zone risk. I could look at home equity and or home home ownership time. So just because people have a high sell score, they may not have the equity equity to sell. Maybe they refinanced not too long ago. Uh, but I could say, okay, I want people with at least fifty percent equity that have been there more than five years that have a high sell score. You could filter it that way. Uh, for me, I would just go, tell me who has a high sell score. That's still better than the whole neighborhood. So now it's a targeted approach, right? And depending on where you are, again, you can knock on the door and say, you know, hey, my name is Jeremiah. Um, just in the area because I have a buyer that would love to live in this neighborhood. Okay, they lost out on a multiple offer situation at, at the house, the next street over, whatever you know the address, right? They're looking for a four bedroom, two, two bad, 2,000 square foot home. Uh, they are already pre-approved or they're cash buyers, whatever they are, right? For this amount of money, uh, do you know of anybody that's looking to make a move or how long do you plan to stay in your current residence? All right, just another way of saying, do you know anybody looking to buy or sell? Same same question, just asked in a different way. Do you know anybody looking to make a move? And and then I always like to highlight, like it's it's a perfect scenario. You don't have to get your house ready. 
You don't have to put it on a market. You don't have to worry about showings. You have flexible terms and conditions, uh, and you can get the money that you desire to make the move. Oh, wow. Tell me more. I sold, let me think, two houses ago or three houses ago. We sold our house uh, by somebody knocking on our door. First of all, so it was a real estate agent knocking on our door and like, hey, like, tell me what you would pay. I didn't tell them I was a real estate agent yet, but they told me. And I'm like, shoot, yeah, we'll move. <laughs> <laughs> they gave us time. There's a neighborhood we wanted to be in. A house came up. We bought a house that was like, okay for now just to get into that neighborhood you know if there's certain neighborhoods you want to be in sometimes you buy the house that's okay not the one that you love and then last year we moved to the house that we really really wanted jack and do you have a question um no i i i don't have a question i just wanted to say sometimes um when you have uh, multiple offers like that you you know to to Cut to the chase. You just tell everybody, you know, give your highest and best. That's what the seller wants because there are a lot, of, a lot of offers on the table, and that's a much easier process than going back and forth with a lot of different people. Absolutely, yeah, and and depend. There's different, there's different um, things that are customary in each market. Like right now in our market where I live, they do what's called a, a delayed. Uh, negotiation period, meaning if a property is listed on Friday, they put in there, it's actually a form that they sign in with the MLS that there will be no negotiations on this property until Tuesday at 6 p.m. So everybody gets to look at the property and then they know that there's a final deadline uh, to present their offer. But same thing, highest and best, but I think having the conversation with your clients, to, some people, a lot of people watch HGTV, right? What do they say? Oh, yeah. I, we might get a counter, right? We can't go we can't go down like, well, you might not get the property either. You know, yeah. so it's, it, you never, you know, I always say, you may not get a, you can sleep. I said it to my, depends on the rapport you have. You can say you could sleep on it, but you may not sleep in it. Okay. Uh -huh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Depending on the rapport, of course, some people may not like that. Uh, so with realists, sorry. Uh, Realist is your tax record system many of you have, but whatever tax record system you have, right now Realist does have a cell score in there as well. Each one of them has their own unique algorithm, which determines the cell score. It's based on many things, their shopping habits, their, their search history, their, um, you know, the housing related statistics in the area, all, 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 the, all those kinds of things. So you can go in there and you can search on same thing realist you go in there search by map that's how we sell real estate right it's based on location 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 so you find the location and you can zoom in and you could say okay i want to search by high score which is six they do it on a zero to a thousand 625 to 830 or i'm sorry very high is 831 to 1000 and then these are the they're all color coded. You could then actually export those houses to mailing labels if you wanted to do postcards or something like that, or letters, or, or you could just go, like my favorite thing to do is just go knock on the door. Okay, you could also do it on your phone. Um, but here's kind of the other things, just like Remind that you can filter by. You have building type, county land use, home equity, last sale price, mortgage age, owner occupied or not, um, and ownership time. Why would you? Put owner occupied or not. If they're not owner occupied, what is that property? Rental. A rental. Yes, Tiffany, you are the winner. Uh, but what you could, there's an agent in my office. She sold 354 houses last year. She does it because she does a lot of investment properties. So she'll find one rental and then she'll look up that LLC or that person's name to see, you know, how many other properties do they own. Because sometimes, uh, you know, some of you are in resort markets. Uh, you have the waterfront, you're on the south shore. Right, Tiffany, you're like Long Beach area, right? Long Beach. Yeah, that's a hugely resort market. So it's like uh, you have those, those rentals. Somebody might have one and say, okay, I'll give you this one. And they're really testing you out. If you do well with that one, then you get all of them, right? You get the, the whole thing or if they want to sell the whole thing. And this is where when we talk about on role play, like not turning down rentals, a lot of times with those vacation rentals or seasonal rentals, 
those turn into listings down the road if you take care of the people and you don't turn down the business. Andy, you have a selfie stick? I'm distracted. Okay. Yeah. Uh, RPR. Also, I know you thought it was just for the reports, but they also have a prospect for clients feature on the last update. They're making this better and better. Uh, again, if you're in a, in a realtor market, if you're in, in the city, sorry, Eric. Um, but you can look through here. It gives, it, it'll walk you through. See where it says prospecting at the top? You click prospecting and then say prospect for clients. Would you like buyers or would you like sellers? And then they have a whole ebook uh, on how to farm and prospect for new clients. If you want that, send me an email and I'll send it back. I don't have a landing page or anything. I'm not trying to capture your emails, okay? Just don't feel like looking for it right now. Reevaluate. Um, this will help you within your sphere. Your network's large and your network. Okay, because there's certain, I'm not going to share videos too long. Uh, certain life event triggers. We we know this. Diapers, diamonds, death, divorce, diplomas, downsizing, discretionary income, the daily grind, and dumpsters. Uh, dumpsters was the one that surprised me. Like, dumpsters? And I was like, oh, shoot, you're right, right? When you see a rollout dumpster in a neighborhood, what's happening? Something's getting torn out, cleared out, gutted, something. There's some kind of renovation happening, uh, and that usually leads to a listing. So they look like many of the others, different data sources. You have social search, spend, and government. Um, they will stack your own sphere. This is the difference between the others. They look at your own sphere of influence. For those of you who don't like to call your sphere, Jose Cruz, he left. Uh, he was here earlier. <laughs> He's great at cold calling, but hates calling people that he knows. He will cold call for eight hours a day um, when it's legal. and But if he has to call somebody like a relative, he hates it. So this is a great way to say, oh, you know, I, Lori is a 97 out of 100. I call Lori and go, Lori, how are things? I'm not going to call and go, Lori, my crystal ball says you want to sell. What's up? I'm in real estate. You know that, right? Like, that's kind of creepy. Just call and have a conversation. Do the Ford, the family occupation, recreational, or dreams. Uh, and and it, it may come up in the conversation where they go, Oh my gosh, Jay, it's, I'm so happy you called. We were just thinking about, we, we were, oh, I can't believe it. That's where you're like, it's magic tricks. Yes, Andy. Okay. I literally had that happen to me. So this person was a broker and he, for whatever reason, I didn't see him on social media anymore. I'm like, okay, that's awkward. He just got the broker's license. Like, why would you get your social media off? Or he blocked me, one of the two. And long story short, eight months later, fast forward, he calls me out of the blue and I'm like, so I answer and he's like, Hey, by the way, I switched over. I'm a finance guy. I'm like, good for you. Like immediately I hung up and I blocked him. <laughs> I'm like, you had the audacity to call me after eight months and like asking me for stuff. No, not going to happen. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and here's what else. What the first thing that this system does is it cleans up your data because your data is dirty. I don't know any way to put it. It's it's polluted. Okay. Meaning like you have bad emails, you have bad phone numbers, you have just a lot of stuff in your database that needs cleaning up. Uh, they'll do that for you. And then as things uh, like I have a, just a ton of real estate agents in my data, like in my database of people. So you can go through and go, this is a real estate agent. This is a mortgage person because real estate and mortgage people are going to come. They're going to be <laughs> high sell scores because we're searching real estate related things all the time. Okay. But this is a great way to just, for those of you that love talking to your sphere and want to just, that's the best way to work by referral. That's what I would do. Okay. It's uh, reevaluate.com. It was independent, uh, independently rated by a third party, 19.5% accuracy, which means one out of five people that they said had a high sell score ended up listing in, in the MLS within the next six, within the next six months. I'm hearing loud noises. Um, <laughs> here is just an example. Uh, we're going to call this lady Wendy because that's her name. And Wendy, she's, uh, I sold her one of her rental properties in the past. She's one of my mom's clients. My mom is a hairdresser for 50 some years. And so she had a score of 95 came up over here. And then I got, you also get text messages. And then she came up with a 96 over here. So I'm kind of blocking her with my face, but 
So then I, I sent sent her a text. I said, good morning, Wendy. Hope all is well. My crystal ball tells me that you might need a real estate superhero. Because at the time, I'm just testing out what to say, right? Like, I'll say anything just to see if it works or not. Uh, and it's in line with how I would speak to somebody anyways, right? And is that right? And then she said, not yet. Cassie and Chris will be staying in a campground for a couple months and then hopefully buying. Cassie and Chris, Cassie's her daughter. So they sold their home in another state and then didn't have a home to buy in Rochester and ended up had to live in a camper for six months. She was be staying in a campground for a couple months and then hopefully buying. Okay. And then I said, is the junkyard dog email. That was her email. She's a antiques collector and her email is junkyard dog. Now she wasn't selling or, uh, or buying, but the reason why she came up with a high sell score is because she's a millennial parent, parent of a millennial. Right. We have helicopter parents that are, we're used to doing things for us. So she was doing searches for Cassie and looking up properties and doing all those things. So that's why her score came up high. So don't, don't, the data never lies. Cause some of you will go, Oh, well, I know that Gabriel's not never moving ever, ever, ever. He's going to be, yeah, but he might be looking up stuff for his cousin or his son or his daughter or whoever. Okay. But wait, there's more. Okay, I have five more minutes or so. Uh, Likely.ai will also predict sellers. They all have different algorithms, so don't ask me how they work. Uh, they send you the leads. They're not for free. Hi there. Don't need that. SmartZip also uses predictive analytics. If you want to do direct mail, I would use SmartZip over just using EDDM, every door direct mail or whatever, uh, however you plan on doing direct mail because you can then target the people that are more likely to sell on a farm. So now you can increase your frequency and effectiveness, right? Rather than everybody, I'm sending it to the 10 people. And I even tested them. I go, well, what if I just want to send it to waterfront homeowners uh, in 14612? And they're like, you could do that. I was like, hello, let's go, right? So you can really, uh, they do it by MSA, market service area. Now, uh, Sister company, parent company, subsidiary, I don't know where they fall in the hierarchy, but they're related to SmartZip, Offers.com. Uh, what they do is they predict the list, listings. They have you know an algorithm that leverages machine, machine learning like everything else. Uh, people that are most likely to sell in the next 12 months. However, the big difference between them and some of the others is that they discovered that many agents get leads, right? Few agents can convert those leads. So then they created another company Are you a real called Roof, awful name, but gets results. What they do is they convert those AI leads, then they send them to you when they're ready for a referral fee. Okay, offers, gets the leads, Roof's, Roof closes those leads for you, and then you just pay a referral fee. So some of you who are like, I don't want to pay up front to have an area or whatever. I don't believe the leads are good. Well, then you're going to pay more because what they do is they take those leads and they, they target them with social media ads and Google ads and pay-per-click and all these other things uh, until they convert. And then you pay a referral fee on the back end. So you either pay up front or pay uh, at the end. Old expired listings. This is, again, one of my favorite. I talked about this in the door knocking class, but this applies for everybody. You have people looking. You go into the MLS. You say, okay, I want to go March 2020 all the way back until June 2011 in the area uh, where you have a buyer that's looking. You find properties that did not sell. You then look at the history of those properties, make sure they didn't get relisted. Easy conversion. Okay, you just got to call them or knock on the door and say, you know, what was your motivation before? I can get you a whole bunch more. That rhymes. Okay, like, oh, if it was listed for 500, guess what? It's probably worth 750 now if it was five years ago. If it was listed for a million and didn't sell, it's probably worth 1.5. I don't care what market you're in. The last five years has, has appreciated at least 50%, if not, you know, 100 to 300%. Okay? Espresso Agent. They also have leads. I'm giving you all the leads. So <laughs> they have leads. They have for sale by owners, for rental by owners, and they have expired leads. And they they uh, they scrape them from different sources. They'll send them to you. They're verified. 
Uh, but if you don't want to call them, there is also another company called Support Realty. Uh, they have uh, people that can call for you. They're actually based out of Zimbabwe. So they have a cool, it's like South African accent. Kind of UK-ish, but still pretty cool accent. Um, and they're like 12 bucks an hour, right? So if you're not good on the phone, you're not good at converting, I always say, you know, throw money at it. Spend time with clients, do what you're good at. Uh, have people converting leads for you and send them and setting appointments. Okay, so action steps for all of you. If you weren't in, in the first episode, first, <laughs> first episode, yeah, the first part of this, uh, I'm going to put up my learning so you can go back and watch it. Uh, but you need to create your buyer presentation, right? That's critical. Uh, I'm going to do a live stream tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., on my Facebook page, at J-Man Speaks. It's going to be one hour. I'm putting your buyer presentation together, the important components of that. So I would love to know if you have any questions. Right on time. I have like a buyer folder that includes the buyer presentation. Um, should I like show it to you at some point so you can tell me if it's too much or if it's just right? Yeah, did you create it in Canva or where did you create it? I did. I have a portion of it in Canva and then the other portion, the buyer profile is separate and the buyer presentation is separate. But okay. the folder is has it... like the buyer stuff. Yeah, send it to me. Take a look at it. Um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, we also talked about your unique value proposition. When we talk about that, I gave you all the tools necessary, but you have to realize it's almost like what's the problem that my client's having, which one of my unique values solves that problem, right? If, if, uh, Gabriel, do you speak Spanish? Yeah. Yes, I speak Spanish. Oh, okay. As soon as you unmuted, I got you. So if, if you met with a, a potential buyer or seller, that did not speak English very well, right? They were Spanish was their first language. That's a unique value for you because you can communicate more effectively. Yes, correct. Does that make sense? Yes, of yeah. course. Yeah, I just wanted to make that point for everybody. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Because like his Hispanics are the fastest growing demographic in the US for first time home buyers. And there is not enough resources and there's not enough agents depending on where you are in the country. Uh, to service them. So that's a huge, unique value. Uh, if you're big into, you know, if you're working with investors and you've done investing, if you're working with flippers and you've done flipping, right? Uh, if, you, if you're if you a lifelong resident, like Tiffany, how long have you lived in Long Beach your whole life or Long Island area? Yeah. Yeah. So again, Tiffany would use that in working with buyers. Like who better to serve you as a buyer's agent than somebody that's lived there their whole life. I've been in Long Beach. I know everywhere uh, uh, about that and I can help you to make the right decision because many of the things that buyers look to us for, the number one thing when NAR asks them again and again is to help them find the right home. And so you have to be able to figure out how can I help you find the right home? Okay. However, if I was relocating to Long Beach for the first time, like me as an agent, I'm brand new in the market. I'm like, I just moved here. What can I say? I just moved here. I know what it's like to relocate to a new area coming from a different area, right? So it's like, it doesn't matter. You all have different experiences. You all have different educations. You have all different expertise. You can all use it to your advantage. You just have to kind of connect the dots when, when the buyers are there. All right. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all. You've been great. Uh, I wish I could have accepted all of your offers, but next time, next time I will. Make it a great day. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome.